This is our planet radio. Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. Well, after much ado and great delay, welcome to the live edition of Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. It is March the 7th, 2012, and uh, I apologize for the delay there. We had several connection problems getting things lined up, and it's all good now. Uh, we are live and streaming on the mighty WSR Wolf Spirit Radio. Dot com. The chat rooms are up, and uh, we will be taking calls over the course of the show. So if you have questions or comments for the guest, we will get to that in the due course of this first hour, hopefully. We're going to run two hours tonight. My guest is Dr. Joseph P. Farrell. And uh, just a couple of announcements. First off, I want to say thanks uh, a number of people have hit the donate button on the website at offplanetradio.com, and I want to thank you for supporting our efforts here, for putting some weight behind what we do, and uh, uh, thank you so much for doing that. Also, next week, two hours, we will have James Martinez online, and he's going to be talking about cold fusion and the social implications of free energy. James is the spokesman for Cold Fusion and um, <clears throat> some of the things going on around the discovery by Dr. Rossi over in Italy. We'll talk about that. It's highly controversial and uh, so again we'll be discussing all of that next week with my guest James Martinez coming up. The following week we are going to do a show on the Indigo Children, Crystal Children, Ascension, things that sound kind of new agey. We're going to find out what that's all about. My guest will be Krista, and I also have a UFO contactee who will be joining me during the course of that program. With any, without any further delay, I want to welcome my guest. He is a, a doctoral in patristics from the University of Oxford. He also has a background in physics. He writes on alternative history and science and what he calls strange stuff. His current book is called Apocalypse Theater Part 1, Yahweh the Two-Faced God. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Nazi technology. We're going to talk about a lot of things that play into the arena of the alternative culture. Joseph Farrell, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thanks for having me on, Randy. Pleasure to be here. It's good to finally get you on the air. I think we've been crisscrossing each other for a number of years. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of interesting how we've overlapped. Uh, you've obviously been doing uh, journeyman's work. You're, you're, you've published, gosh, how many books have you published now? Uh, it'll be 16. Um, two of them out now are with my co-author, uh, Dr. Scott DeHart, including the, the Yahweh book that you mentioned. And uh, we've got another one in press that should be out in October, November with Feral House. And uh, I'm working on another, another one right now. And so is he. <laughs> so we're busy. Good stuff. You busy guys. You busy. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, give us your website and uh, anything else you want to put out in terms of contact information, Joseph. Uh, my website is www.gizadeathstar.com. That's all one word, all lowercase, and Giza is spelled G-I-Z-A. And they can get all my books uh, right there off the web store. Good stuff. We're going to talk, I think, in the first hour. I, I want to go maybe kind of spin backwards through your well-connected body of work because your work is very connected. Uh, yeah. you, you begin with the Giza Death Star in 2001 and bring it forward. And right. I, I think 
maybe what we'll do is we'll kind of spin backwards in this because I, I want to talk to you a little bit about this book, Yahweh the Two Faced Guard, which Two Faced God, which is part one, I assume, of a, a, a multiple part series. You have entitled yeah. Apocalypse Theater. That's an intriguing right. title to me. It's it, it's a title that that my co-author and I have been talking about for a number of years. We you know we're looking at the apocalyptic culture that surrounds us, and and a lot of it's coming out of religion, as you know, and a lot of it's coming out of New Age and, and ufology, and and uh, it seems to it seems to go into two streams, Randy. We've got we've got a utopian version of it in a lot of the New Age uh, with expectations of ETs coming to help. Make Mankind out of this difficulty with you know 2012. There's the raised consciousness school, and then on the other hand, you've you've got the the religious crowd that are literally pushing for you know the apocalyptic events of the Book of Revelation to happen, or if you're Muslim for the yes. Imam Mahdi to you know come back, or if you're an Orthodox Jew, you're expecting the Messiah and all the apocalyptic genocidal <laughs> events that go on with that. So, yeah, we decided that, that we kick it off by, by looking at, at the whole character of Yahweh in, in the Old Testament. Now, in this book, you present a very detailed and fascinating outline of what you call the, the, the God Yahweh, the Yahwist religion. This yes. monolithic, vengeful God of wrath that's pictured yes. in the Old Testament. Where do we begin the narrative on this this God, and how do we dovetail it over into what is now present day Christianity? Well, that's a good question, and part of where we begin comes out of the fact that that uh, Doctor DeHart had long ecclesiastical experience and it was it was for both of us an unhappy one um, mm-hmm. we both we both went through a lot of uh, suffering and, and anguish because of it and over the years uh, we we talked quite a bit about this phenomenon and we came to the conclusion that the behavior that we had seen that had been dished out to us individually was not just an accident of, you know, badly behaved people. It's endemic to the Yahwist religions because it comes out of the moral schizophrenia of Yahweh himself. And and that's where we went back and looked at Egyptologists, essentially, and their view of Yahweh. Because, as you say, what we've got here is a moral contradiction. We've got, on the one hand, claims that this is a God of love and so on and so forth. And yet, on the other hand, if you read the Old Testament with anything like objectivity, this God is ordering the Hebrews to go around and slaughter people. And, you know, there's all sorts of crazy, kooky reasons advanced for this in in theological circles. But the bottom line, Randy, for us, was that if this behavior were exhibited by any human being, they'd be hauled up for war crimes. You have very little difference between the behavior that's described in the Old Testament and, and the behavior of the great dictators of the 20th century, Hitler and Stalin, Mao, and so on. So this this appeared to us to be the, the place to start, is to show the moral contradiction. And then we wanted to show the the problem that results from this, and this is really where we started with the book. The problem that results, Randy, is that you have a division of the social space. Look what we have. We have a claim that a man went up a mountain, had a special message delivered to him personally by someone claiming to be God. So we're initially put into the position that you either have to accept this on faith or reject it. So there's a schism in the social space. If you accept it, then you subject yourself to all the programming that goes along with that moral schizophrenia. The other problem that this whole Yahweh's tradition introduces 
is it introduces what we like to call a schism in the temporal space. Because if you look at the way Egypt is portrayed in those first five books, well, Egypt comes to symbolize all that is darkness, all that's idolatrous, all that's rejected. So the other problem of the Yahwist traditions is they are secondary religions. They are always based on a rejection of a prior tradition. They, they are based on something that's assumed in order for them to define themselves in opposition to it. So in other words, opposition to the sort of cosmological nature religions of the rest of the world becomes one of the defining features of, of the Yahweh's tradition, be it Judaism, be it Christianity, be it Islam. Mm-hmm. So it introduces into, into the psychological space of the person joining or practicing one of those religions. It introduces into the psychological space the paradigm that every human being that one encounters is viewed in mechanistic terms rather than humanely. They're either viewed as potential converts or potential enemies. So you have this constant paradigm of infidel versus believer, you know, heretic versus orthodox and so on and so forth. So in other words, the program is a program ultimately of the division of humanity. Now, as we talk about this, we're dealing obviously uh-huh. with the Yahweh's tradition. Obviously, uh-huh. the Bible itself portrays a very narrow historical view, something that most right. biblical literalists can't deal with. Do right. we have do we have overlapping chronologies that give us a wider clue as to the historical epoch in which this was all occurring? In other words, something that gives us another picture of what you call the social space in history. Oh, well, yeah. The, you know, I, I've written several books dealing with, with ancient culture, with ancient cosmologies, with ancient philosophy. And basically we come down to the fact that there is a and and this has been throughout all of my books that there was a very high civilization in high antiquity that that predates Egypt that predates Babylon and and predates the Indus Valley and each of these civilizations in turn views themselves as a legacy but the basic cosmological metaphor is that they all share something in common, and that is that there is a a creator, and as a result of that, it's it's a natural religion. In other words, it's not something that's that is revealed to one person alone on a mountaintop. It's accessible to all. And this is what Yahwism defines itself in opposition to, because the very nature of, of those three Yahwisms is the idea of a special revelation that sets a certain group of people apart from the rest of the world. And the other thing, Randy, you, you asked, and I, and I didn't address this, you asked why we chose the term apocalypse theater. Well, one of the problems of the Yahweh's traditions is that once you make a claim to have a direct and special message from God or from E.T. or whatever, you'll notice that the same meme mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. works in ufology. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. The problem is, is once you have made that claim, then the claim requires you to believe that your system, your, your doctrinal system, is... And a claim to absolute truth, all right, to which every human being either must submit or be converted. And that inevitably introduces into those Yahweh's what Dr. DeHart and I call the apocalypse meme. In other words, the final triumph of the religion, the final triumph of the truth according to them, always lies in a future. And if you look and examine the futures depicted very carefully, those futures in most instances are depicted as being imposed by violence on the rest of humanity. So in other words, the whole apocalypse meme is also a part of the dialectical necessity of these religions. It is something that is inbuilt in them. So we wanted to expose that and and get people to thinking, you know, about these truth claims because, you know, you don't have to look 
too far and wide in the world today to see what problems are arising from these conflicting truth claims. As you did and Dr. DeHart as well, I come from a pretty steep background of theology and religion and specifically Judeo-Christianity uh-huh. as, it's, as right. it's framed. And within that context is this constant need to reinforce the legitimacy of the religion itself and the way it's done here it's done through the written word the bible and then secondarily through the invoked the invoked word the ritual and all the other things attached to that but it appears to me to be a framework that is self-enforcing unto itself without any outside referential points is that kind of a fair way of looking at that well, well, yes, I I would agree, and, and I think if Doctor DeHart were here, he would as well, because what you have in in those religions is first of all you have a book god, the book literally becomes god, the system becomes god, and therefore it must be defended at all costs, be it in terms of intellectual commitment or or even more violent acts to do so, but the. The real problem there is that the book also functions as a set of programming. In other words, you know as well as I do that that the Judeo-Christian tradition is very good at a kind of self-policing. You, if you find yourself mm-hmm. thinking of certain thoughts that that fall outside of the doctrinal system that you've embraced, then it's it becomes part of your programming to assume that uh oh i you know i'm straying close to the edge of the faith i'm I, you know i'm going to fall outside the box and again this is one reason we wanted people to look at the early founding of of yahwism by looking at the moral contradiction of the character himself as as is depicted in the old testament the book becomes god and in the ancient metaphor that yahwisms define themselves against the book literally is all of creation in other words it's something everyone has access to there's no there's no so to speak no need or necessity for special revelation for a special message everybody manifestation of it all right that's the key here define themselves by defining themselves in opposition to egypt they're really defining themselves against a universal tradition that that is widespread all the way from from vedic india to to mayan central america to you know lakota north america you, you you've got a fairly consistent version of of the cosmological metaphor in all of those cultures that yahwism defines itself against So the people who would be seen as, let's say, a more nature-oriented, worshipping type people, people who experience God through the natural elements, through what we would consider to be indigenous people today, would be closer to what we would consider to be the outside group relative to the Yahwist religion. Yeah, exactly. Yahwism defines itself against that primordial tradition. That's that's the crux of the matter. And as long as it does so, in other words, by defining itself in opposition to something pre-existing, to a certain extent, it always needs that enemy to fight. Otherwise, it loses its self-identity. So in other words, I go back to what I said before. You you By adopting this paradigm of... of belief in a special message from from a higher being or beings you are always in the mentality or mindset of looking at every other human being in a mechanistic way as either a potential convert to your system to your thinking or a potential enemy to it there there's no ultimately there's no room in your in your moral compass to treat people with compassion first. Your first thought is of them, where do they stand in terms of my belief system? And you know, you know as well as I do from from dealing with with Christianity that this is almost an inbuilt habitual response to people. Uh, this this drive to witness, so to speak, for your faith. Uh, it always enters the conversation rather than having a sincere, genuine interest in someone else as a human being. In your studies of this, and, mm-hmm. and I'm relating now specifically to this thing we call the Bible, 
Right. Does it appear that there are numerous gods mentioned in the Old Testament and that there was simply a dominant god which took over at some point? Well, that's a very good question. There, There is a school of thought in biblical scholarship, Randy, out there right now that does indeed take the view that the Hebrews had a whole council of gods. And you don't have to look very far if you know if you know the ancient Hebrew. Right. The term Elohim, which is used for God, is translated that way in, in most English translations. Well the the word Elohim literally means gods. The the ending of that word, the Him, is a three or more plural ending. And that incidentally is is the term that's used in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 where yes. God says let us make man in our image well quite literally what what it's saying there is the gods are saying let us make man in our image in other words it's a real plurality it's not it's not a plurality of royalty or anything else there's a biblical scholar out there right now by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser that right. that has that has taken this view so it it is something that that biblical scholars are aware of Right, he's talking there about the Divine Council. Where yes, I, the Divine Council. I think he stops short of a designation of them as gods, but more as like this advisory right. council. And we've, right. had, we've had people on the show who have articulated a number of different things, including the idea that, yes, there is a pantheon of gods that were co-creators within the cosmology of what we would consider right. to be the singular creator. Right. There, There is a long Christian uh, patristic tradition that, that essentially takes a similar view. So, you know, it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. uh, what the real question I think that you're addressing there is where does Yahweh fit into that picture? Yeah. Well, if if you look at his behavior, can you really sit down and say what morally distinguishes his behavior from the behavior of Satan or Lucifer and when you get right down to it if you know this this is a fascinating to do to explore if you get right down to it who ordered more executions and murders and genocides in the mm -hmm. Old Testament mm -hmm. Yahweh or Satan so in other words, if it's true that you know someone by their fruits, then what does this say about this Old Testament God? If it is true that, you know, Christ actually spoke the words, you are of your father, the devil, and he was a liar and murderer from the beginning, then what does that really say? You know, the church has wrestled with that, and there have been theological responses to that little conundrum that ranged the whole board. But but most of those responses, Randy, ignore the basic problem, and that is this moral schizophrenia. So, in your book, you talk a great deal about opposition to the metaphor. Can you explain a little bit about what the metaphor is? Because you seem to... you you capitalize it and maybe it gives us a place to kind of understand this opposition and sure. also kind of a, a context to frame this in people who sure. don't have a background in theology Joseph and you have among us a, a great deal of learning I've spent a lot of years in this and I have to admit that when I bump up against this there are a number of quandaries that present themselves and identify oh, sure. the context Right. Well, the metaphor is something that, that I've written about all the way back, really, to uh, a book called The Giza Death Star Destroyed. I wrote about it, again, at, at great length in, in The Philosopher's Stone. Um, Dr. DeHart and I wrote it about it in greater length in Grid of the Gods. Obviously, we incorporated it into Yahweh, the Two-Faced God. And again, we, we wrote about it in our book that's coming out this fall called Transhumanism. The metaphor basically underlies, to give you a bit of a historical overview, basically underlies the thinking of, of the Vedic texts from India. It underlies a lot of the Mesopotamian texts, if you look carefully enough. It certainly 
definitely underlies the thinking of the Mayan Popol Blue, their their version of you know their sacred scriptures, and most importantly, it underlies the the civilization and culture of Egypt, out of which comes, of course, uh, the writings of the Hermetica, the Neoplatonic philosophers in, in the second and third centuries. Now, the metaphor is this. And it's very important for people to understand what I'm now going to do. This is a thought experiment, all right, in order to show why the metaphor doesn't require faith in a religious sense. If you can imagine a realm or a sea or an abyss of an infinitely extended sameness, in other words, in which there is absolutely nothing distinguishing about it. If you can imagine that, then what you're dealing with there is, in fact, a nothing, capital N, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Because in the physics sense, and please understand, this is where this is where the physics part of this comes in. This is, this is why it's not necessarily a, a religious metaphor. Right, right, and this is the cool part, too. This is the cool part, and this is the part, as you say, that raises all sorts of huge, huge questions. And, and as I say, Dr. DeHart and I got into those questions uh, in the Yahweh book and Grid of the Gods. We get into it again in, in um, the Transhumanism book coming out this autumn. When you, when you imagine this infinitely extended nothing, in physics terms, you are dealing precisely with nothing. Because for something to be an object to science, to physics, it must be distinguished. It must have some distinguishing features, all right, to be an observable object. Mm -hmm. So we've got this, we've got this infinite nothing. And obviously, when, when you're saying this, you're also dealing with something that lies wholly outside of space and time. All right. Now imagine that you cleave that space, that you draw, simply imagine drawing a line through it or something to that effect. All right. At the immediate instant that you do so, you have created three things, each of which is, so to speak, a differentiated nothing. You've got one region of nothing, you've got another region of nothing, and then you've got the common surface between the two, which is itself a kind of a nothing. And this is exactly the cosmology that you see unfolding in the Vedas. It's exactly the cosmology that you see unfolding in things like uh, the Egyptian Edfu texts. It's exactly the cosmology that you see with the Neoplatonists. And you even have a version of it with, with the Mayans, as I said before. Now, the very fact that you can imagine, that you can think of doing this, and the very fact that you have instantly created a 1-3... All right. This is the reason that so many ancient cultures have trinities, primordial trinities. You can, you know, you need to only think of uh, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva yes. in, in the Vedic tradition, or the One Noose World Soul in in the Neoplatonic tradition, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in in the Christian tradition, and so on and so forth. On and on we could go. But in other words, what what I'm suggesting here is that this metaphor is so widespread, and it comes out out of thought, it comes out of imagining that first step, the initial event, the first event, so to speak, which gave rise to everything else. This is this is the cosmology, and this is why in those societies, in those philosophical systems, you don't have appeals to special revelation, the special messages given to certain individuals authorized to speak for God or the gods. Literally everybody, at a certain extent, has this. Now, it's interesting, just, just to add an aside, because obviously I'm, I'm skipping enormous amounts of, of historical data. It is sure. true that within the Vedic culture, that you did see the rise of, of Brahmanism, of an elite priestly class, that was 
according to their own statements, empowered to interpret this metaphor. But it's equally interesting to note that the person that undid all of that and said, no, 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 you are misunderstanding the metaphor. Everybody is a manifestation of this nothing. Well, guess what his name was? His name was Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. That's precisely what he was objecting to, Mm -hmm. was Mm -hmm. this later accretion of a priestly elite to interpret this metaphor. All right. So, yeah, this is this is essentially what Yahwism defines itself in opposition to, because this metaphor, if you look carefully at, at Old Testament statements, is a form of idolatry. All right. Because ultimately, this metaphor does not allow you to make a crystal clear distinction between creator and creation all right to some extent in that metaphor particularly in in the egyptian and hermetic versions of it mankind is a co-creator a participator in yes. the act of bringing about creation uh, that's particularly true you see it uh, particularly in the hermetic texts and that that come out of the egyptian tradition but anyway I, i'm rambling but i hope that makes no actually you weren't rambling sort of you sense. <laughs> no you pulled a lot of elements into that that are worth considering i'm sitting here and i'm thinking about people listening to this and especially people who maybe heard me on radio years ago mm-hmm. and their their thoughts in terms of I am completely burning the bridge behind me in terms mm-hmm. of monotheism, in terms of what is written in the Bible, and mm-hmm. some people thinking, well, he's lost his faith, he's lost his mind. But mm-hmm. for me, talking to you, and we've had some conversations, mm-hmm. this, is a clarif- this is a clarifying process, because right. attempting to reconcile... The God of love in the New Testament, to whom Jesus refers to as the Father, right. with right. this monolithic, wrathful God in the Old Testament has been, quite frankly, a struggle for many years. Sure. And I think for a and lot it of it is for most people. And I think for a lot of people, Joseph, there is now an opportunity for resolution within a context that doesn't destroy one's belief in God or right. one's belief in the work that Jesus did when he was on the right. earth. Well, this is this is the other thing that, that we were trying to point out in this book, is this metaphor is, uh, how to put it, this metaphor actually frees you. Once you understand the, the very, very high mathematical uh, explicitness of the metaphor and, and, and note that in, in the Yahweh book we, we actually couch the metaphor in formally explicit mathematical terms, all right? And, and the reason why is to show that it can be put in those terms, all right? Now, once you've seen that, then you can look behind the texts from the Vedas to, to Mesopotamia to the Hermetic text to the Neoplatonists uh, to to the Christian fathers, to to the Mayan Popol Vuh, you can look behind all of the religious language of various textual traditions and see that in fact they're talking about the same thing. In other words, the metaphor mm-hmm. re- frees you from the the book God, uh, frees you from making a book or a system God. All right, and it allows you to see its occurrence in all cultures because it it quite literally does exist in almost all human cultures most of people who have been raised in the west in right. the form of christianity that we would refer to as fundamentalism or evangelicalism have been uh-huh. raised to believe that it is heresy to consider yes. so-called quote pagan unquote religions as co-equal in some way these uh-huh. are to be considered by those faiths as the heathen they are either to be converted or to be ostracized or ultimately to be destroyed right well again you know I go back to what what I've said previously that 
mentality comes out of the moral schizophrenia of adopting the character of Yahweh and the text that depicts the, that character as your God. And please understand, Randy, that what happens when people do this, like it or not, is they enthrone a text. They enthrone yes. their system as God. All right, They're more about defending a book than about understanding the illumination within their own heart. All right. Now, you you raise the question of the response of Christianity to the metaphor, and this is where modern event. You know, I call it the American civilization civil religion because it has little to do with any form of actual historic Christianity. It's it's an American invention, and it's it's a cobbled together horribly conflicted uh, theological and moral mm-hmm. system. Yes, to say the least. If, if, you, if you go back to the early church fathers, uh, I'm thinking of people like uh, Anaxagoras or Justin Martyr or uh, even uh, Clement of Alexandria, people like that. Mm-hmm. If you go back to, to this group of, of what are called apologists in academic circles, it doesn't take you very long to discover that these men were dealing with this metaphor in a major way and they had to admit that there had to be some truth with it as far as they were concerned this was a truth that had become garbled by demons well this is precisely the point of going back then and looking at the morally conflicted character of Yahweh because if ever there was a garbling of the metaphor it comes from that special revelation and the claims to a special revelation that are made, you know, on behalf of, of those books of Moses. So that's where the metaphor gets garbled, uh, in, in my opinion. And, and, you know, I'm not speaking for my co-author here, but I, I think that, that if he were here tonight, he, he would probably agree. I mean, we've, we've talked about this, this whole thing for almost two decades. So, yeah, it's it's a morally conflicted vision, and that's why, again, you get the mechanistic response to other human beings in terms of the convert-enemy dialectic. It's always there because it's part of the character that the religion is founded upon. It's systemic. It cannot be gotten rid of. And all attempts of, of theology from uh, the early church fathers down till today have never successfully resolved that problem in my opinion and and again I think uh, Dr. DeHart would agree yeah hopefully the next time I have you on we will bring Dr. DeHart on as well because there's a lot more that in future yeah, shows I want to cover yeah, he, he, he has uh, you know he, he came out of a slightly different Christian tradition than I did but nevertheless and he's studied a lot more in terms of uh, the Vedic culture and so on and so forth. So it's very important, I think, you know, for people to understand that his reasons and, and uh, motivations for saying certain of the things that we did in this book would be slightly different than mine, and I think equally beneficial. Now, if we flash forward a little bit. Sure. Um, uh-huh. Right now, we sit in the present time. We're in 2012, and quite frankly the air is thick with all sorts of expectations and you you kind yes. of alluded to this early on in the show but we're at a boiling point on a number of fronts right now and one of them yes. happens to be oh no surprise the middle east and specifically iran and specifically right. israel right. and the expectations wrapped around this are so rife with danger I, yes. I, my words fail me. And I, for years yes. uh, on my other radio shows, I have assailed those who held to Zionist beliefs based on the very system that we're talking about. My missing link at that time was that I was still trying to reconcile a, a set of, let's just call them two data sets, that didn't match. Right. And right. for a lot of people who will hear this show later on, because it will thread through different networks over the over time as, as it goes out, um, 
I've been in the state of distress over this. How did we get to this point? How do we resolve this? How do we bring the world to a place where it's not on the verge of war because of the three Yahwist faiths? And we have right now, I mean literally, a hair trigger sitting in the Middle East. And a yes. lot of it is because of the extreme factions of Zionism, Christianity, right. and right. Islam. All right. Uh, yeah. And again, I, I can understand why your words fail, because this is such a huge topic. And, and Dr. DeHart and I did get into it in, in that book, but certainly not in anywhere near the depth that it, that it could have been done. Let's first of all look simply at the historical Christian doctrine versus the modern American abomination of, of dispensationalism in particular, mm -hmm. and in particular the rapture doctrine, because yeah. this is playing and fueling a big part of the American geopolitical response to the Middle East, all right? In historical Christian doctrine, and please understand when I use that term, I'm not talking about the Baptist religion, you know, the believer's baptism sure. religion. I'm talking about Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Anglicanism primarily. In other words, those churches that can claim and do show an actual historical pedigree dating back to the early apostles. Within that body of doctrine, the, the doctrine of Christ, if you examine the writings of the church fathers, is that Christ is consubstantial with all men. In other words, by, by the claim that God becomes man, when he dies and rises again on the cross, that is a sacrifice that affects everyone in all times and in all places, bar none. All right? That means, as a result, that in Christian, classical Christian teaching, there is an absolute, once for all, final abolition of any special claims of the part of Israel being the Jewish people as some sort of special vehicle chosen by God. All right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, there can be no return whatsoever to any Old Testament system of sacrifice. All right? Now, when we go to the rapture doctrine, this is exactly what is being claimed in the claim that the church is going to escape the suffering of the tribulation, which is a massive misreading of, of Scripture. And with that claim, when the church is taken out of the world, they fall back on a reinstitution of the Old Testament sacrifices and the special privileges of Israel. And that, of course, precedes the, the coming of Antichrist and so on and so forth sure, yeah. in, their, in their interpretation of, of uh, Daniel and Revelation and, and some other texts. Right, right. Now... The whole problem is, first of all, this is all based again, as as you know, we, we discussed before. Even in the classic historical Christian position, this is all based on the character of Yahweh and the moral contradiction therein. Because even in those systems, you have the requirement that mankind owes God an infinite debt but can't pay it, and only God can pay it, therefore God becomes man, and God slaughters himself <laughs> quite literally <laughs> to, you know, to pay off this debt. So in other words, in the system, it reduces again to a mechanistic view, because what does this make God? It makes God a banker balancing account books, all right? Mm -hmm. And the whole... Uh, the whole drama of, of the life of Christ as depicted in the, in the Gospels is nothing, therefore, other than a stage play, uh, a, a, an account juggling trick to make the books bounce, all right? <laughs> you know? And that sort, of, that sort of defeats the idea of God being a loving, forgiving God if he can't forgive anybody without requiring the slaughter and sacrifice of his own son by torture and execution. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the system... The, no way 
in no way you approach this system can you avoid this inherent moral contradiction. As long as you as long as you canonize the character of Yahweh and therefore canonize certain texts as your authority, as your program, this moral contradiction cannot be avoided. So you ask the question, how do we how do we step back from this apocalyptic abyss? Well, in the end of the book, uh, Dr. Dart and I say essentially that it's not so much the idea of God that has to go. It's the idea that you make the equation God equals Yahweh. That's the problem. Because once you've accepted that, then you've opened yourself up to the truth claims either of Judaism or of Christianity or of Islam. That's the problem. So it's that's why we spent so much time with that metaphor to show that the metaphor of uh, you know that it, primordial trinity that that one three uh, producing three entities there is your metaphor of love right there. And if it's capable of being being presented in in the Vedic context or in the Hermetic context from Egypt or in the Neoplatonic tradition or in the Mayan tradition, if it's capable of being presented in any sort of philosophical way, then you don't need a special revelation in order to believe in it. That's that's the key right there. I guess you just. I hope that made sense. No, you planted so much (laughs) out there, you know. And if I was going to be a good talk show host, I would have something to just follow that up one. But I'm sitting here and my head's spinning because we have. (laughs) I guess where I where I where I'd like to go with this is um, was there an attempt infusing together these old Hebrew manuscripts, which you know are not as old as most people believe them to be, onto uh-huh. the New Testament, so-called, uh-huh. and, and putting uh-huh. it into this book between black covers called the Bible. Was that all an uh-huh. attempt to fuse together these two, what they call dispensations, in a way that theoretically they would harmonize and we would somehow reconcile the schizophrenic Godhead that we have? Well, I, I think... What you're really asking there is the question, were these books the creation of an elite uh, in yeah, order to basically yeah. in, 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 in order to empower itself? All right? Yeah. Now, we've been talking on the implicit assumption that the character of Yahweh, that there is a real character that was behind all of those Old Testament stories. Mm-hmm. But now let's let's Assume, for the sake of our, for the sake of argument, the opposite point of view. Let's assume that the character was made up. All right. What you would have then, of necessity, is someone concocting these texts in order to empower themselves. Because number one, look at what the text, what that does, what this moral contradiction does. It empowers a certain group of people to speak in behalf of it and attempt to resolve contradictions. That's number one. Number two, the creation of this kind of moral schizophrenia is a kind of social engineering. Oh, I love you, and please understand that I'm mm-hmm. beating you and slaughtering mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. for your own good. You know, this is a kind of, of of abuse mechanism that is a way of gaining control, of gaining influence over people through the process of abuse. This is why it takes so long. And, and I loved your word the other night that that you used when we were speaking. This is why it takes so long for people to detoxify mm-hmm, from this mm-hmm. process. Yeah. Because it is a technique of social engineering. It is a classic technique used by elites to empower themselves by putting out two mutually contradictory data sets and then proffering a synthesis of those data sets. And this keeps going on and on and on. We know the process in secular terms as as the Hegelian dialectic, right, thesis, right. antithesis, synthesis. Well, this is, exact, is exactly what you have in those texts. You've got a thesis and an antithesis. You've got two contradictory 
moral data sets that the elite can then manipulate and keep themselves in power. So, yeah, do I think that that is a possible uh, hypothesis for the origin of these texts? You betcha. And I'll go even further, Randy, and say that if you look carefully at the statements in, in uh, the book of Ezra, for example, after the return of the Hebrews uh, from the Babylonian exile, mm -hmm. you can see evidence in, in the statements there that, that there is something going on on the part of the priestly elite to codify and systematize the Jewish religion. And that certainly would have included their texts. So is it possible? You betcha. Now, you asked about the New Testament. And huh. I, I don't want to get too too much in detail, but, but if you look at two things in a very broad fashion, I'm, I'm not trying to get nitpicky and, and into all sorts of uh, pedophaging details here, but if you look at two things in the New Testament, you have essentially a kind of quasi-hermetic expression mm -hmm. in the Gospel of, of St. John, and to a lesser extent in, in uh, some of the epistles. And then you've got the reassertion of Yahwism with the synoptic Gospels, which attempt to tie uh, the life of Christ more directly back to the Old Testament. Yes. And even more importantly, you have this character by the name of Paul, all right, whom we are asked to believe was given a special revelation all by himself, mm -hmm. out alone, mm -hmm. on no the road second in the witness, desert. no third witness. And, uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> We're asked to, to believe that that this man was given a special revelation alone on a road, kind of like George Adamski out in the high desert of California <laughs> with his aliens. All right. Yeah. And on the basis of this, if you read the epistles attributed to Paul, what you see there is a systematic re yahwas uh, re uh, to to coin a word, of, of the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 I am dying to share uh, the insight of my co-author, Dr. DeHart, concerning who he thinks Paul was. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's clear that here we have a case that could be made that, again, something may have been co-opted by an elite attempting to keep this metaphor plugged up. Because if the metaphor ever really fully breaks out into the open, as it, as it almost did uh, in a complete fashion during the, the Italian Renaissance, if it ever breaks out into the open, it's a huge threat to these entrenched religious systems and their empowered elites. I mean, my word, you only need to look in the Renaissance period at how men who were championing this metaphor, Tommaso Campanella, Giordano Bruno, and people like this were either imprisoned or burned alive yeah. because they were a threat to the entire system. So we sit here on the precipice of this 2012 juggernaut we yeah. have a ruling elite in the world and we're going to talk about this in the second hour uh, sure. a little bit more under an, another context but we have this ruling elite which have been empowered and enshrined as a result of a monotheistic religion be it Judaism Christianity or Islam and they are competing right. forces, but they seem to be a control mechanism of the same type. And they're just simply yes. warring for which uh, particularly brutal form is going to win. And we have this right. apocalyptic theater, and this is brilliant. The title of this book grabbed me right away, because for a long time I thought, you know, this feels contrived. It feels it artificial. Is. It's alien to the nature of man. Um, it is. We were created to love one another we were yes. created to be part of a, 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 an entire world that was created for us and yet we have almost destroyed this planet and we have destroyed millions if not billions of lives over the, con over the course of history in the name of these religions and it's like my yes. god when does it stop it, it only stops when people wake up 
to realize that they have committed a kind of idolatry by by enshrining these book gods. All right. Uh, my co-author and I took a lot of time, as you know, in that book to show that at least in the case of the modern American pre-tribulational dispensationalist system, that you have a system that was indeed deliberately contrived, number one, and number two, deliberately contrived, in our opinion, to serve the moneyed interests of the elites and the geopolitical imperatives of the British Empire and then later the American Empire. All right, mm-hmm. the you know the the system is as you know we 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 spent some time in the book talking about uh, Sir Halford Mackinder, a famous absolutely. Uh, British this is huge. Yes. Yeah, it's it's very huge. A uh, famous British geopolitician of the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, and. Mackinder, his system is basically um, based around a, a conflict, a clash of civilizations. Well, as we point out in the book, the early backers of the dispensationalist system were bankers like Henry Drummond, mm-hmm. oil barons in charge of you know uh, California's Union Oil Company, you know the Union Seventy Six gas stations. In other words, there were big people promoting this rapture system, the, the University of Oxford, uh, you know, much to much to our chagrin sure, yeah. was involved in the, was involved in the publication of Cyrus Schofield's reference Bible. Now, you know, here's a man with no academic standing, with no academic credentials <laughs> whatsoever, and yet the Anglican controlled Oxford University Press is going to publish this this piece of, of theological swill. This means to, to put it very bluntly, this means that there are major players that want this system out into the world as a major meme. And the purpose of it, Randy, is for the manipulation of a geopolitical agenda in the name of a religion. Not for nothing did these early dispensationalists send delegates to the early Zionist Congresses mm-hmm. at, at the end of the ni- 19th and at the turn of the 20th century. So, yeah, it's a huge, huge story, and you know, I urge people to look into this because if they're following this this nutty rapture system, they are preparing the ground for their own self deception. You know, and and uh, it, it, it's vital people wake up and and start realizing that a god of love does not require you to go slaughter your neighbor. You know, the bottom line. The question everyone should ask themselves, if they are really lit- biblical literalists, is if God told you to go slaughter your neighbor because he was of Nephilimic blood or some other sort of nonsense, would you do it? And if for a moment it gives you pause, then in that pause you are questioning the entire system. So be honest with yourself and admit it. I think we're going to break this hour on that note. Again, the book is Yahweh, the Two-Faced God, Theology, Terrorism, and Topology. Uh, It has over its title head, Apocalypse Theater, and I think that pretty much sums up where this all heads unless we, we, we turn the corner on it. And I think you can tell... I'm a little emotional about this, and it actually surprised me, but I spent a couple days living with this book, and the closer we got to interview time, it really started to strike me of how critical it is that people study this out and that they get their minds around what's really been invented here and what has been contrived by the elites who rule this world right now. So we'll take a break at this side, and we'll come back on the other side. We're going to talk about, well... Nazi technology, uh, things that have been hidden from us, the Nazi international which still survives today, and we'll do all that on the other side of Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. We'll be back in about six minutes. <laughs> 